so for a few years now, folks have been a little, uh, presumably at war, and I don't know why, about st doing structural work versus reduced form work. And I'm going to try to tell you that this war is silly and that these different things can be used for, to answer different questions. And more importantly, they can be used together to get insights to the same question that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. And I'd like to um, give one bit of thanks to my PhD student, Yuan Shi. Um, about two weeks ago, I said, I have to write a new PhD lecture, help. I need to find some papers that do this. And so she went out and helped me find a bunch of papers. So I really uh, want to thank her for that. Okay. So in my own way, I've managed to try to classify the ways of integrating reduced form and structural work, and I kind of came up with five types. So what I'd like to do in this talk is give you a little bit of an introduction to what I mean by reduced form versus structural. I'm not going to talk about how to do any of this stuff. I've done that in previous FMA lectures. So, I, but I do want to give a sense of what I mean by the different methodologies. And then I'll go in through my typologies and conclude. And it should take about until 9.30. Okay, so let's go. I always have to say this. This is a fight that I'm losing. I hear this term all the time and I'll probably lose this fight and it's not a big deal, but I am not a big phrase of the word for structural model. Um, because all economic models are structural in the sense that they impose some structure on the enormously complicated world that we see out there. So usually when people say structural model, they mean dynamic model. So, and that's, that's usually the, how I hear the term. And so that's why I'm not a big phrase of the term structural model because it doesn't really give you the sense whether something is dynamic or not. And that second bit matters. But let's get back to the point of the talks, which it does make a lot of sense to talk about structural versus reduced form estimation. So, I want to talk about a little bit about what I mean by these different models and how you would estimate them. So this first line here looks like what we have learned in basic econometrics since forever. So a statistical model describes the relation between two or more random variables. So y equals x beta plus u. And if all is going well, then this error term u should be orthogonal to this vector of variables x. Usually it's not, and then you need instruments or natural experiments or something like that. But basically you're just looking at a statistical relation that you have assumed to be linear. Economic model is very different. It starts with assumptions about preferences, constraints, production functions, equilibrium. But then what it does is that it takes predictions from the model about the relation between observable and often endogenous variables. And so what it does is it takes these predictions and it checks to see if these predictions from the model are the same as the predictions in the, that you actually get in the data. And then it uncovers the model's parameters by getting the data facts as close as possible to the model facts and trying to assess model fit. So that would be something like a J-test for a GMM-based estimation or a likelihood ratio test for an MLE-type estimation. And the parameters that folks estimate include things like preference parameters, technological parameters, other sort of time invariant institutional features. And so basically then, I think that if you wanted to boil down what I've, how I've been describing structural stuff, I think you could encapsulate it in this one sentence, which is structural estimation ascertains whether optimal decisions implied by a model represent 
actual decisions by agents. And those could be firms, banks, households, and I'll give you a couple of examples with venture capitalists, and I'll give you another example with a regulatory agency. And then what kinds of econometrics? All sorts of econometrics. So GMM, maximum likelihood, simulated maximum like simulated method of moments, simulated myth myth minimum distance, which is actually a superset of SMM. So SMM is matching moments, like just plain moments, means, variances, covariances. SMD is matching not only moments, but functions of moments. So a regression coefficient is a function of moments. Simulated maximum likelihood, that comes in a couple of flavors. And I'm not going to talk about those now, but just to let you know that that's out there. There's indirect inference, which is actually a superset of SMD. SMD is one example of indirect inference, but there are other likelihood-based methods. And then all of the two-step methods that are used by the structural I.O. folks, which are quite clever. I'm going to talk about one paper that uses that. Do I see some? I'm pausing. I am not getting the Q&A up. Oh well. So Tony, the question is uh, from Jeff Coles. Okay. He says there's no hurry on this. And he's asking, is a non-dynamic one period model structural if you superimpose a specific functional overlay on the data? and then estimate parameters in unusual ways, such as by inverting the FOCs to discover the parameters of the decision problem. Perhaps there's a- Oh, of you're talking about your own paper. So you're talking about, is the model structural or is the estimation structural? Of course the model's structural, it's a model. But is the estimation structural? That's also structural because you're using predictions of the model to get underlying parameters from the model. So yes, that both of those are structural. I think my point was that all models are structural. Rina, is there another question in the question and answer? There is another question and it is thank you from Jeff. It's not a question. It's just a thank you from Jeff. No, it's just a thank you. Oh, and I can grab these now myself and put okay. them somewhere, I think. Never use a new computer on a um, talk. In any case, the moment estimators ascertain whether model implied moments in the data represent real data moments, and the likelihood estimators use economic models to construct likelihoods. In both cases, the simulation estimators are used with models without closed form estimating equations. The GMM and MLE are used uh, for models with closed form estimating equations. And then the last thing I wanna do is talk about what identification means in these two different frameworks. It basically means the same thing. And that's something I've also given an FMA talk on but I'd like to go over it because I'm going to refer back to these ideas from time to time. So it's useful to just get them out there. So in a reduced form work, y equals x beta plus u, we really want to know whether y affects, x affects y, that's usually what we're after. The problem is, is that y might affect x or some other variable z might affect both y and x. An exogenous variation is really useful for answering this kind of question. So a really good instrument or a nice natural experiment. What this does is it allows for a clean, like only X affects Y, not some other thing like Z. And a directional interpretation of an estimated regression coefficient. It's less under useful for understanding the mechanisms that drive causal elasticities. So you can estimate this el elasticity beta, but this elasticity beta might itself be a function 
of a bunch of, say, preference parameters, technological parameters that are in some model, either verbally in your head or mathematically on paper. What does identification mean in structural work? Well, first, structural work doesn't identify elasticities. It's, there are other things to estimate that are quite interesting. The goal is to estimate parameters. And so identification just means, does the econometric objective function have a unique minimum or maximum, depending on whether you're doing, say, a moment-based or an MLE-based estimation at the true parameter vector? So how do you get this unique econometric objective minima or maxima? Changes in the model parameters have to predict changes in the data. And you need a unique mapping for parameters to features of the data. So a moment has to move when a parameter moves, or a likelihood has to shift shape when a parameter moves. And you need also precisely estimated data features. If you're trying to identify something with a feature of the data that has only two data points, you're not going to get much out of it. In reality, all parameters affect all features of the data, but the mapping at least has to be one-to-one -one and onto. You have to be able to invert it. Not that you can prove it, but at least you have to, in principle, be able to invert it. I think reduced form and structural are useful for very different purposes. And both of them are super interesting. So reverse form is great for getting answers to causal questions. This is the bread and butter of program evaluations. And those papers can be extremely interesting and important. These causal questions though are, are often only one part of a bigger picture for most other fields in finance. And they're only useful for understanding economic mechanisms in the presence of assumptions. And so I see a gazillion papers that say we have, oops, a causal elasticity. And then they have section four of the paper that tries to uncover the economic mechanism. Usually that's done via a bunch of cross-sectional tests that are motivated verbally. When that's done well, it's phenomenal. It's just great. I love it. When that's done sloppily, it's less, less interesting. But what's interesting is that these verbal arguments that motivate the cross-sectional tests are really, are really models. They're verbal models, but they're models. Okay. Structural is useful for questions involving the word why but it does require a mathematical model, so not a verbal model. And what do you get out of that? You can get counterfactual questions like what ifs. You can get impulse responses like what happens if you shock a variable. You can also get economic intuition and measure magnitudes of things. And I think often a richer answer to any question involves both methods. So I'm gonna go through a bunch of examples. So I think that are like, I think of, the, I, I was looking at all these papers and I was sorting them into piles. And I think there are five types of integration. The first one is the model incorporates reduced form shocks. Second, part of the model is simplified via reduced form regression to reduce complexity. Third, the model extends the external validity of the reduced form result. So that's letting the structural part make the reduced form part richer. And you can flip that on its head. The, a reduced form regression can serve as an external validity check for a model. And so that's letting the reduced form part extend the structural part. And then there's a very specific thing that's been quite popular lately, which is using models to address selection problems. So let's get started. So I'll start with type one. I've got two examples. And so what I'd like to do is tell you what I mean a little bit more specifically about type one, and then we'll do the two examples. So build the model to incorporate reduced form shocks. So these, this type of paper usually starts with a clean natural experiment or exogenous shock. And so the first part of the paper is utterly just a reduced form paper. 
But then a model is built to feature this exogenous shock. So why would you do that? So you want to quantify the unobservable parameters that drive, that drive the reduced form exercises. And so that's one reason why you might do that. The other thing that's interesting is you can observe counterfactuals. Um, you can take these reduced form elasticities and with the model, extend them. It's also very useful for providing economic intuition. Why not? Provide identification. So there have been folks wandering around saying that you need exogenous variation to identify structural estimations. And that answer is sometimes you do, but not always. And the reason is the same reason that's related to all of the cross-sectional tests that researchers do to uncover mechanisms. I think I've said this before, but it's also worth repeating. So if you can have either really nice or less nice stories that motivate regressions or sample splits to isolate a specific economic force, these stories are verbal models, and these stories are analogous to features of a model. And so it's almost the other way around. The features of the model feed into the reduced form elasticity, not the other way around. Okay, so let's go through a couple of really nice examples. Well, one's nice, the other is mine, but that was just because it's easier for me to talk about my own papers. So this first paper is really, really interesting and well done. Windfall gains in stock market participation. So this paper starts out with three research questions. And the first is, what happens to stock market participation after cash windfalls? So right there, you can see this part is reduced form. Cat, they found a cash windfall that's exogenous and they're interested in stock market participation. The next question's a little bit harder, which is why are some households participating and some not? That would be harder to get at using just reduced form methods. And then, but maybe not impossible. And then the third question is the hard, hardest one which is what are the costs preventing them from doing so? So for that, you need a model. And by it doing both reduced form and structural stuff in the same paper, you can get a richer picture of this basic question. So let's talk about the reduced form part. They're looking at um, lottery prizes in Sweden. And so they, you get this lottery prize and then it's exogenous shock, shock to household wealth. And it's, it's, it's nice, it really is a shock. It's just, um, there are no substitution effects, there's just an income effect. And, but what's interesting about this particular experiment is that there's random assignment of lottery prize payment methods. So you can either get it as a lump sum or you can get it as a per period annuity. And those are um, assigned randomly. So that's kind of interesting. So that helps them differentiate the type of cost that might prevent the, the winners of the lottery from participating in the stock market. So is it a one-time stock entry cost or is it a per period participation cost? So now, so that's the question. That's the uh, natural experiment. They've got these nice lottery prizes. And then what do we learn from the reduced form part? So 150,000, everything's in terms of US dollars. $150,000 windfall from lottery wealth increases the probability of stock ownership in post lottery years by 4%. So not much actually. So where is this effect concentrated? It's concentrated in previous market non-participants. So they mostly see it in folks who didn't, pl didn't play in the stock market before. And it's mostly concentrated in the lump sum prize payments instead of the monthly installments. So that's interesting. So that means that there must be some kind of a one-time entry cost instead of a per period participation cost. 
that explains household stock market non-participation. So that's pretty interesting, I think. So then what's the structural? So there we go. But that's not all that, but we still don't know why they're not participating. What is it? Do they have behavioral biases? How big are these costs? Do they have crazy expectations? What's going on? And so what they do that next is they use a life cycle model and they have costly stock market participation choice and they've put in an unexpected lottery prize windfall. So this is the part where the exogenous shock goes directly into the model. And then they, ask, they, ask, they just do simulated minimum distance. So then what question can be answered by the structural part? So first, how big does the cost have to be? The reduced form part can tell you whether it's a per period cost or a lump sum cost, but it doesn't tell you anything about how big the cost has to be because there's no sense of what people's utility functions look like. The average entry cost for the pre-lottery equity non-participants is over 31,000 US dollars. But the, pro the problem is, is if you just take a standard life cycle model with pretty standard preferences, that cannot rec reconcile the small amount of participation. So the rest of the papers tries to understand what kinds of frictions or strange beliefs or strange preferences might affect this. And so in this sense, the paper, paper is also quite behavioral. So they estimate models with behavioral biases. Doesn't do anything, still a big disaster. The, what they have also is data on surveys of beliefs. And that's the part that allows them to figure out that it's probably belief biases and in particular pessimism that's the likely culprit. So I don't think that they could have done any of these things, which is understand why these folks are not participating in the stock market without a model because it's all about preferences. And it's hard to find stories that would allow you to split samples to isolate preferences. And so you really need a model. So what do we learn from that we could not learn otherwise? Just to sum up, we've got the random lottery prizes. It provides an exogenous shock to household income. And you get the, you know the directional effect of wealth on participation and you know it, it exactly that it is wealth. For the second top, for the identification of the type of stock market participation costs, it's also useful. The structural part makes it possible to do two more things. You can quantify the size of the cost and you can eliminate possible explanations for non-participation. And so in that sense, you can really learn more from doing both together than you could by just doing one. So that's example one. So this is the example of incorporating actual shocks into a model. And you'll see that the shocks themselves weren't useful for identifying anything in the model. They just allowed the model to be relevant for the reduced form exercise. Okay, and then there's this paper that I have with my former student from Rochester, Ivan Ivanov, taxes depress corporate borrowing evidence from private firms. And the research question is a very, very, very old research question, which is how do taxes affect capital structure? So the first, so there's a reduced form part and then there's a structural part. So the reduced form part just uses a staggered diff and diff to establish causality and sign and magnitude. Then there's the structural part, which does two things. It illustrates intuition, but it also allows you to get at counterfactual effects on firm value and maybe eventually on, well, I'm not done that yet, on welfare. So we've got some newish data from the Federal Reserve Board on US private firms. 
and we're doing a staggered diff and diff around changes in state corporate income taxes since the late 1980s. And we can distinguish between enactment dates of taxes and effective dates. Most people use effective dates, but we've also gone back and looked through all of the legislation and figured out the dates where all of these tax and changes were actually passed. And there's, there's a difference and it's usually about two years. So what do we obtain from the reduced form part? So corporate leverage increases following tax cuts and decreases following tax hikes. And you think, huh? Actually, the first time I saw that, I thought, huh, that can't be right. That doesn't make sense because that makes no sense given our, given our intuition about the tax benefits of debt. You would think that if tax cuts would lower the tax benefit of debt and therefore lower leverage and that they would, and that tax hikes would increase the tax benefits of debt and then increase leverage. So that's a strange result. The other thing that happens is firms increase investment following corporate income tax cuts. That's not surprising at all. Interestingly, the results are strongest for small healthy firms. They are almost not there for small unhealthy firms. And of course, the reason is, is that small unhealthy firms rarely pay taxes in the first place. But they're also present in large public firms. So we have a strange result. And I think when you have a strange result, you need an explanation. And so to get at the explanation, we estimate an equilibrium model of an economy. So there's a consumer, there's a whole bunch of firms, and there's a pass-through intermediary. So firms are financed by internal profits and by external risky debt. And so what's important in the model is that firms can default. Then they make debt decisions, they make hiring decisions, they make investment decisions, all in anticipation of future tax changes. And so they are, they don't just react to one-time tax changes, they worry about future tax changes, tax changes. And then in the model, we have directly dialed in the tax deductibility of interest expense on debt. So that's directly in the model. And so the tax benefit is there. So where does the reduced form part fit in? Well, one of the moments that we match, it's actually, of course, a function of moments, is the reduced form tax elasticity. So the elasticity of leverage to changes in taxes. And why do we put that in there? We use it actually to identify firms' perceptions of tax permanence. And this goes back to the old public uh, finance literature, say David Bradford, that tax changes that are perceived to last longer have larger effects. And then so, this helps us understand the extent to which firms believe that tax changes will be permanent, but we also include the moment to make the model relevant to this particular experiment. It turns out that state tax changes are pretty small. And depending on the other frictions in the model, they might or might not have any effect at all, given how small they are. So then what do we learn from the structural part? So first, I think the most important part is we get intuition for the reduced form result. And the basic answer is that interest tax yields are just part of a bigger picture. They're there, but they're not everything. And the other part of the picture that matters are the levels of default thresholds. So this is not the Miller tax, the horse and rabbit stew. So this is not the, the rabbit. The rabbit in the Miller horse and rabbit stew is a default cost from a one period model. We're looking at how these default thresholds move over time, which is something you could only get in a dynamic model. It turns out that the quantitative, quantitative effect of taxes is quite small. And um, the quantitative effect on default thresholds is quite large, like an order of magnitude larger. And so there you go, that's what does it. The other thing we can do, so that's the first part is we get some intuition from the strange reduced form result. 
and is from a model that was estimated on the exact same data that produced the reduced form result using the reduced form result as part of, as an identifying moment. Then we can look at the effects of, um, we could do some counterfactuals, which are not in the paper right now, but are certainly on my hard drive. So it turns out taxes are, if firms are using debt as financing, taxes are worse for firm value than they would be otherwise, because if you have a tax increase that directly hurts firm value, but it also makes them use less debt. And so they get less of a tax benefit. So that's the paper. And I think we learn more from combining the two types of analysis than we would from either just doing the structural part because you'd say, really? Fine, does that actually work in the data? Or from just doing the reduced four part because then you would ask the question, well, why, why, why? And putting them two together allows you to answer both types of questions. So that's type one. Type one is, do you, is incorporating a reduced form elasticity indirectly into a structural estimation. And then there's type two. So this has become extremely popular lately. So part of the model, and it's something I've done a lot of too, is simplified via a reduced form regression to reduce complexity. This is super useful for highly complex models. One of the things that happens when you give a structural seminar is people will ask you, I want to see this in the model. I want to see that in the model. I want to see this in the model. And at some point you have to say, look, I can't put everything in because it would just be a, a, a complicated mess and impossible to estimate. One of the nice things about thinking about the model carefully and thinking about the estimation carefully is that you can sometimes actually have a pretty complicated model if you use reduced form methods to estimate part of it. So you simplify the model whose mechanism is too complicated to add to the current model, but also doesn't really affect other parts of the model so that you can do something simple. So this, I think that if you look at all of the very popular demand estimation methods that are being used in corporate finance and banking and actually even in asset pricing, I think they fit in this category. You're trying to estimate utility parameters and you're doing it with regressions. There's some other stuff that folks in IO and labor economics have been doing for a long time. One is this very, very clever conditional choice probability method, which is from the old Hotz and Miller paper. It's super clever. I'll illustrate that in an example in a bit. And then there's the policy function approach from Bayari, Bankard, and Levin. And in the corporate finance literature, there's a nice paper that I'm going to go over shortly by Kang, Lowry, and Wardlaw. They use the CCP, conditional choice probability methods. And then there's this uh, nice paper in the RFS by Matt Fullis and Cero that use the BBL methods. I'm gonna talk briefly about the Matt Fullis and Cero paper just in words without slides. And then I'll talk about the Kang, Lowry, and Wardlaw paper in a little bit more detail. So the Matt Fullis and Cero paper is looking at a model of a firm with a whole bunch of divisions. And all, okay, so that's really complicated, right? Because if you have a firm with a whole bunch of divisions, they're each solving their own little optimization problem. And then there's all the optimization problems have to be re-optimized by headquarters and it's a mess. The BBL methods allow them to estimate this very complicated model without having to solve it a gazillion times, which is what you'd have to do if you were doing something like simulated method of moments. Let's though talk about this paper. This is an underappreciated paper. I like, I was not a referee on this. It's in the RFS. I have no idea who the referees were. It's called the cost of closing failed banks, a structural estimation of regulatory incentives. It's just a really well done, important, interesting paper. So how do, the question is, how do regulators choose to close a troubled bank? Okay, so 
how would you do that with a um, reduced form regression? I suppose you could figure out, like do a predictive model of what's going on, but you wouldn't really understand why, you just have some observable variables. So what they do is they use a dynamic discrete choice model. So the regulator is the optimizer and the regulator can either close or open. And what's the trade-off? The trade-off is an aversion to closed banks, which is traded off against the higher risk and future deposit insurance costs from delayed closure. So they don't like to close failed banks, but if they don't close the failed banks, they might, there might be, it, things might get worse in the future. There might be another SNL crisis. So one of the genius of the Hotz and Miller uh, methods is that the regulator has utility from open, the regulator has utility from closing, and the difference in regulator utility from each decision, so you've got utility from one, utility from another, it's proportional to the probability of each decision. So that's cool. That, that's just super ingenious because the probability of each decision, you can estimate it with a logit, which is cool. So what's nice about the estimated logit is you're really just interested in that ratio. You're not interested so much in getting like exogenous variation or anything like that. You're just trying to describe the data to get the probability. So they do that. And then with the estimated utility functions, they can conduct counterfactuals within the model. And so they find that there are lots of delayed closures. The, the FDIC does not like to delay, to, um, does not like to close banks. And the reasons are a lot of political influence. They actually don't like to close the very largest and the very smallest banks, it's the medium ones. And they do like to defer costs. So I think that if you were just doing the logit itself without the, um, model underneath, you might be able to get some kind of a sense of the probability of closing large versus small, or you could get measures of political influence and you could say whether they affect or don't affect, but you really couldn't figure out which, pro which um, items were most important in the regulator's utility. And of course that requires some assumptions, but there's sort of this, as we all know, there's this trade-off in econometrics. If you make more assumptions, you can say more. And so they make some assumptions about regulator utility, and then they can say a lot more about what's going on. And that's not assuming the answer, it's, um, making sensible assumptions about a model that allows you to derive some interesting predictions. So I like that paper a lot and I think it's somewhat underappreciated. And it's using the CCCP, the CCP stuff, which takes about a second and a half to compute. So it's actually worth learning because it's not like the stuff that I do, which can take months to compute. It's actually, it just takes a couple of days to compute or a couple of seconds to compute, sorry about that. Okay, so that's one example of using a reduced form regression to simplify a complicated problem. Next paper is one of mine. So this is a paper with um, three of my, well, two of my former students and one person who, for whom I was their external reader on the dissertation, that's Kai Rong Xiao. It, it, the other two are Yu Feng Wu and Yi Fei Wang. So title is Market Power and Monetary Policy Transmission, Ev Evidence from a Structural Estimation. And so in this type of exercise, to what ex we're asking to what extent do market power and regulatory fi frictions affect the pass-through of policy rates to bank lending decisions? So what we've seen say post-crisis, like the previous crisis, not the crisis we're living through, is that when regulators or when the Fed moves rates, nothing happens. 
And so we're, and so there must be some frictions in the banking system that are causing this to happen. So this is by nature a structural question because we don't have data on frictions. So we have to think of some other way to back out which frictions matter the most. Unfortunately, the model has to be really complicated. So first, if you go to the bottom, you need dynamic optimization by banks. So you want to solve that, you have to do a fixed point. But then you need, one of the things we're interested in is market power. So you need imperfect competition between banks. So each bank makes its decision, taking as given all the decisions by all the other banks. So that's another fixed point. So now we've got a fixed point inside of a fixed point. And then we've got, there has to be an equilibrium between lenders, borrowers, and banks. And an equal, solving for an equilibrium is another fixed point. So you've got a fixed point inside a fixed point inside of a fixed point, and that's a mess. That would take forever to deal with. So we simplify part of it. So we estimate loan and deposit elasticities using the methods in Barry Levinson and Pecos. And then we plug those estimates in the model. What's really nice about that is that the market's automatically clear because banks choose interest rates, taking into account all the other choices that the other banks are making. But once you've got that from the, these demand elasticities, the market's automatically clear. Because that's right, a demand, demand estimation is under the assumption that supply equals demand. And we get a bunch of interesting results. So market, actually deposit market power matters a great deal for the, the lack of transmission, but so does bank capital regulation. And then we um, also find something called a reversal rate. So if the federal funds rate goes too low, that actually lowers bank lending. It doesn't increase it. And then we also have some stylized facts that support the deposit market power channel and also the reversal rate. So this last bit is interesting because this is also part of what I will call type four, which is using simple reduced form facts to valid to do external validation of a model. And so that's what we're doing with this last bit is, and so this paper incorporates two integrations of reduced form and structural. So for one, we're simplifying part of the model so that we can use reduced form techniques. And in the rest, we're using simple reduced form methods to validate what we find in the model. Okay, I think I've done with type one and type two. So what was type one? Type one is you have an, an interesting reduced form elasticity and you use that as an estimating moment in a model to provide information, to provide intuition, to do counterfactuals. Type two is you have a really gnarly model and there's no way you could sort of estimate it by brute force. And so you find some clever way to simplify part of the model so you can estimate it in some other way. Just a sec, the cursor went somewhere where it wasn't supposed to go. Okay, then there's type three. So the model is used to extend the external validity of the reduced form results. This is interesting. This is something that you see an enormous amount in the economics literature and not so much in corporate finance or banking or personal finance. So the first is trying to assess the general equilibrium consequences of reduced form estimates. So this is something that say urban and environmental econ economists think about all the time. Why urban? Because there's lots of cities. And why environmental? Because one ecosystem feeds onto another. So that's something you see a lot in other areas of economics, but I haven't seen so much of it in corporate finance. But then there's a neat um, uh, recent job market paper. So this is also predicting the effects of non-compliers, 
in a reduced form regression. So as we all know, when you have very good identification, it typically is only a local average treatment effect. It only refers to those estimates that are for which the experiment, instrument, what have you, affect. And so this is a way to get at the, the effects on non-compliers. So let me talk about two examples here. One is from urban economics and one is from corporate finance. So this is another one of my papers. This is the macroeconomic implications of agglomeration. And it's, we're looking at an old question, which is how does urban density affect productivity? So this could be measured with a reduced form regression. This is an old paper by Chicone and Hall and in the AER, and they are basically doing a production function estimation with, uh, to figure out what happens to productivity when there's density in a city. So that's fine, but that's just for one city. There's a whole bunch of cities. And what if labor and capital can move between the cities? Then that reduced form, those reduced form regression results might not be relevant anymore. So what we did is we estimated a general equilibrium model and we have a density externality. And we use as an identifying moment, what something from this Chaconian and Hall regression. And because we can do that, we can then say that this local agglomeration, when you aggregate it all up and allow for movement between cities, raises per capita consumption by 10%, which is not 10, so by 10%, not 10 percentage points. So that's the result. But it's not something you could have gotten absent a model. And so this is something where, for the other two things, you might have been able to do it with reduced form if you had awesome data, but here you really can't. And then there's this other neat paper, which is um, this one, the best student paper at the WFA. So this is Sam Antill's job market paper, which is do the right firm survive bankruptcy? And so what's he asking? So are these, are bankruptcy decisions to liquidate efficient? And does inefficient liquidation reduce creditor recovery? So he's got two parts. He's got a reduced form part. He's got a structural part and the reduced form part is using the judge instrument. So the judge instrument is that some judges seem to have uh, a stronger preference for liquidation than other judges and judges are randomly assigned to cases. And so you can use this random judge assignment to figure out a causal effect of liquidation on efficiency or on, on creditor recovery. So what he finds is that for compliers who are close to the marginal threshold of liquidation versus emerging from bankruptcy and being reorganized, the average liquidation reduces cre creditor recovery by 58 cents on the dollar. So the problem is that's a very local result because he's using a judge instrument. And so this is only relevant for those observations that are affected by the instrument. What's the question that can be answered by the structural part? The structural part extends the conclusion to non-compliers. And it estimates overall 60% of the liquidations are, are inefficient. So that's, that's also an interesting result that you couldn't have gotten otherwise. So how does this all work? So just to recap, what's the reduced form methodology? It's the random judge instrument. And so the result's a local average treatment effect. What's the structural methodology? It's actually using a Roy model like the, the hunting fishing model, which I used to teach back when I taught reduced form stuff. It's, uh, it's very much like a, it's just a static discrete choice model that, to, that gives you, it's random utility. And if your random utility is in above one level, you say hunt or reorganize or otherwise you fish or liquidate. And I believe his original, um, explanation was in fact hunting and fishing, which is kind of neat. So this, in this context, it's a binary choice between liquidation and reorganization. 
And then in a way that's, and that's loosely analogous, not directly analogous, but I would say loosely analogous to say the Heckman model, it allows for a sample section selection correction to extend the results to non-compliers, which is quite nice. So we've got, so in, so in both of these examples, we can say something that's more general than we could absent the structural part. And so the structural part allows for an extension of the inferences. Then there's type four. So what's type four? Type four is using a reduced form to assess model validity. The macroeconomists do this in spades. In fact, it's really hard to get a macro paper accepted now with a DSGE model if you don't have some other kind of empirical work to give you external validity. So how does this work? If you have a dynamic model, they give you a ton of predictions. You can simulate a bunch of data off a dynamic model. You can get lots and lots and lots and lots of predictions, like way more predictions than you can off of a static closed form model. Some of these predictions are used to estimate the model, but not all of them. And so others are not, and they can be compared to actual data predictions. And so you've got two classes, and the choice of these is somewhat arbitrary predictions that are used to estimate the model and predictions that are external validations. I have this paper with Santiago Basdresh and Jay Khan, and we have a formal test of using these un unused moments. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples of this. My co-author Stephen Terry's job market paper has this. Um, uh, Ottonello and Winberry which is a, 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 almost a corporate finance paper has this. There, it's all over macroeconomics. There are many, many examples. Let me give you a few from finance. So this is also a neat paper. I like this enormously because it's a integration of a really cool model and really awesome data. So they start with this Um, fact that executive pay and the gap between executive and worker pay have grown in the last 50 years. So both of these things have grown. And so first it went down, then it went goes back up, say, in the last 50 years. So they're, they're asking, what's going on? Why would this happen? And so they estimate a model of technological innovation to help understand these facts. And so the model is one where CEOs can identify interesting innovations, but workers cannot, which is probably a reasonable um, split. But the, so, the, so then they estimate the model and they can reproduce these facts in the model that the faster the rate of technological innovation, the bigger these gaps the, or the, between old executive pay and new executive pay and between worker and executive pay. The model also has predictions about the relations between say executive pay and innovation, which is positive, and executive pay and growth opportunities, which is positive. And both of these hold up in regressions that are outside the model. And then here's something, a recent paper that I have done with um, Xiaodan Gao and Na Zhang. So we started out with some reduced form regressions of corporate cash on interest rates. They produce a robust hump shape. It's really hard. To, you can make it go away if you do really fishy observation weighting, which is really fishy. But if you don't do fishy observation weighting, then you get a hump shaped. When interest rates are low and they go up, corporate cash goes up. And when interest rates are above a threshold and they keep going up, corporate cash goes down. This is one of those times when using a model helps with the, in, with the intuition. So we estimate a model 
And it briefly, it has to do with cash helps lower default, the upward slope. So when interest rates go down, default probabilities go, excuse me, when interest rates go up, fault, default probabilities also go up. And so firms hold more cash to buffer that. Mostly we use, it's an SMM paper, mostly we use means and variances for this identification. But what we don't do is we don't use correlations for identification, but the model certainly can produce correlations. And in fact, it can reproduce correlations between output and cash and output and investment, output and in debt. And we don't target them in the estimation, but we do test to see if they're equal. And I think in two out of the three cases, they're not statistically different, which has surprised me. Here's another really neat paper. So this is called Reputation and Investor Activism, a Structural Approach. Um, so this is also looking at a weird fact. So why do targets settle so frequently with activists who face large costs of proxy fights? So that's weird. So these large costs of proxy fights means there's a free rider problem. If I have a large cost of doing a proxy fight and that's going to affect all investors, why should I bother in the first place? And but yet we see all of these proxy fights and they're, they're very costly. So there must be a missing ingredient. And so it must be, a, and so they are postulating activist reputation. And so they estimate a model of unobservable reputation. You can't observe reputation. And that's why the structural part is useful by MLE. And reputation matters. But what's interesting is from this model, they can extract a measure of investor reputation. And then they use that in the data to predict several outcomes like cumulative abnormal returns, 13D filings. They actually have 13D filings in the model. And they can look at the predictions in the model and the predictions in the real data and see if they're the same sign. And in fact, they are. And so that's another way in which you can use these reduced form methods to validate a model in some sense. And I'm on to type five. Type five is very, very, very specific, but it's something that I've seen a lot of lately. I'm gonna go through the original corporate finance paper that used this, but there've been quite a few recent papers that have um, used this. So the model's used to solve a selection problem in a regression. And I think to th talk about this, it's useful to actually go back over what a Heckman correction really is. So what's a Heckman correction? I know you stick the inverse Mills ratio in the regression and look at the sign and blah, blah, blah. But where does it come from? It's basically a, a regression paired with a probit. Where do probits come from? They come from random utility problems. Ah, utility, that's structural. So the agent chooses to stay in the sample if their utility exceeds a threshold, otherwise they exit the sample. And so this is a very simple structural problem. And the model is very simple. So you have utility over some observable variables and they determine whether you're in or out. And under a joint normality assumption, you can Toss, you can simplify this via a control function approach and just toss an inverse Mills ratio into your original regression. But the selection model can be much more elaborate and much more realistic. And so you can deal with selection problems in ways that you couldn't with just a, in, in, in a much more convincing way, I think, than if you were to just do a Heckman correction. So I think this is also a underappreciated paper. So this is Morton Sorensen's job market paper from 2007. It's How Smart is Smart Money? A Two-Sided Matching Model of Venture Capital. So he's starting with an empirical fact. 
which is startup companies funded by more experienced venture capitalists are more likely to go public. And so why is that? So there's a direct influence of the VC on the company, but then there's also a sorting of better companies with better VCs. So the first part is a regression and the second part is selection. And so you can't just do the regression because the selection is going on at the same time. And so you can't tell the difference between treatment versus selection. So what do you do? So instead of just using a simple random utility probit specification for the selection model, he's using a two-sided matching model. So how does this work? So each venture capital can have more than one match but each company can only have one VC and they're in equilibrium when it's stable. So what's a stable matching? A stable matching is one in which when, if you perturb the outcome a little bit, like you take this, for, this startup and move them to another venture capitalist, then that makes any company's valuation worse. These matching models give you likelihood functions but they're ugly likelihood functions that need to be integrated a million times and numerical integration is really slow so that you could never do it no matter how fast computers are. And so he, he estimates the likelihood of an IPO jointly with the matching model and uses uh, Bayesian methods. And so without the structural part, you really couldn't separate the effects of VC influence versus sorting. And he has a really nice chart at the end where he basically shows it's this much treatment and that much selection. It's almost half and half if I remember correctly. So that's, that's one thing. And then here's a much more recent uh, paper. So this is Uens, Gorbenko and Kortoweg. So which is how do VC contracts affect startup value? So this is not due the, do this, do the, um, this is not just general influence of the VC, this is specific features of contracts. And so they ask how big is the size of the pie? Like how big is value? And then how big is the split of the pie, like total startup value between the VC and the startup? So the problem with this is not just selection, but it omits VC quality and it omits firm quality. And so if you were to just do a naive regression of startup outcomes, like did they IPO, did they, get, did they get chewed up by Facebook, something like that, then you're going, not going to be able to get a really interesting answer to the question because you can't see VC quality and you can't see firm quality. You can get rough measures of these things, but very rough. So how do they deal with this selection problem? Like the, the matching of the good VCs and the good, uh, good firms is treated with the estimation of a dynamic search model. So this is different from the Sorensen paper. The, the, the matching models are on some continuum between a statistical model and an economic model, probably closer to the statistical model. And a dynamic search model is way in the economic model category. So they're estimating a dynamic search model of VCs and startups. And so these startups and the VCs search for each other and they match depending on whether they are compatible or not according to a matching function. And the equilibrium contract is endogenous to the quality of the agents. And so the model itself is a model of the endogeneity. So that's kind of neat. And the value of the startup and the split of the value between the VC and the entrepreneur are modeled in a reduced form manner and plugged in. So this is also a type two regression, type two, type, yeah, I think it was type two, where you take, you simplify the model by plugging something in. So what do we learn from a combination of methods that we could not learn otherwise? And so the contract terms we observe in reality don't maximize firm value. And the terms give the VC too much pie, like the, you know, the whole pie, VC gets too much of it. 
And so, but yet startups still benefit from matching with high quality VCs because they grow the pie. So I don't think, I think these are answers to questions in the VC literature that you really could not have gotten at with doing simple regressions. And yet the simple regressions simplify the model. And they allow, they, the model allows the um, treatment of a selection problem. I've seen a gazillion of these things. So uh, there's been several researchers that have used the Jeremy Fox estimators of two-sided matching models. You can, um, uh, Yihui Pan at Utah has a paper that uses this. So I've seen a lot of these papers recently that deal with selection problems by estimating two-sided matching models. So I'm gonna finish a little early and then if you want to, I guess we can promote you to panelists and we can just chat for a while, but let me conclude. I think that fighting about reduced form versus structural methods is a big waste of time and energy because these different methods answer different kinds of questions and they're both really useful. It's not like one is useful and one is stupid or one is stupid and one is useful. Nothing, nothing like that at all. They're just different tools in a, a toolbox and they have the, each have their pluses and minuses. You can have really nice papers that use just reduced form methods. And you can have really nice papers that use just structural methods. And you can have bad papers in both categories. But, but the other thing I wanted to emphasize here is you can use them together to get a richer answer to a question than you could otherwise. 